Welcome to this presentation on the Revit 2016 API news. Before we would get going with the API details, let's take a look at where we are with Revit as a product today. The most important thing to note is that Revit is being used for absolutely gigantic projects with multidisciplinary teams distributed across the entire planet. We see Revit being used for steel detailing, including all the nuts and bolts. Here is an arena in Leeds, a multidisciplinary project with architecture, MEP, structural engineering and structural analysis integrated. In the area of MEP and HVAC, we are moving into a fabrication level of detailing. So how are we going to handle these projects growing bigger and bigger with teams growing bigger and more distributed, integrating more domains into a single project? With that said, let's take a look at the new major release, Revit 2016, and look at how to keep going as a great product and achieve the goals of expanding into new levels of detail and complexity at the same time. In previous discussions of the Revit API news, we separated the topics into rice and wine, rice affecting existing applications and the wine covering all the new functionality. In this case, we have one single slide about changes affecting existing applications, which is this one. It deals with the topics of linked files and loading of families. Obviously both very important areas for handling large projects. So in Revit 2016 the reference intersector provides a flag used to switch on searches for elements in Revit links. There's also a change to the compound structure set layers method, which automatically unsets the structural material layer index. And finally, the new family instance will throw an exception if a family symbol is placed that has not yet been activated. You can check this by testing the isActive predicate or activate a symbol before placing it by calling the activate method. As always, the methods that were marked deprecated in the Revit 2015 API have been removed in 2016. All the following slides are targeted at new functionality. Obviously, some of that will also affect existing applications, but this is the one and only RICE slide. The rest of the topics and the new functionality are arranged around the following four main areas of investment. Scalability on how to handle larger amounts of data in ever bigger, more complex projects. How to collaborate with the ever bigger teams in more distributed locations working on domains and integrating all of that into one single project. The modeling of elements, how to access more detailed geometry, more element data, everyday interaction with geometry, shapes and elements. And finally, the everyday efficiency for the end user in working with the Revit user interface. The area of scalability does not have any visible changes in the Revit API, but the performance improvements will be very clearly noticeable to any user. The most important aspect working with the scalability and performance is that if we take a stupid system and just make it bigger, that won't make it any better. For example, the biggest traffic jam in the history of mankind happened a year or two ago in China with gridlocks of up to 100 kilometers and people stuck in there for over 10 days. So one important attempt 
one important aspect in solving this kind of problem and the strategy that we're following inside of Revit is to strictly decouple the size of the problem from the performance in solving it. Some of the customer experience goals in this area, what people expect is not to be forced to split the model for performance reasons. So model splitting should only happen for business purposes. We want to integrate multiple disciplines into single models, be able to handle unified MEP systems, represent complex as-built buildings, and easily derive the required documentation for fabrication and construction and detailing in the field from the building information model. Some of the projects that we have undertaken to address these areas is progressive display, symbol sharing for MEP system families and reinforcement, graphics instancing, a parallel computation framework currently being used for color fills and later for other areas as well, improved performance handling linked models and a camera-based GREP generation. Here's a video, or rather two videos side by side, showing the relative performance of Revit 2050 versus Revit 2016. In both cases, the system is driven by a journal file, stepping through the same actions. And as you can see in past releases, some of the user activity was blocked by the system until the previous action or regeneration completed. Whereas in Revit 2016, the user can interrupt an ongoing regeneration cycle and continue working immediately. Another area is the parallel derived data update. We want to be able to make use of secondary CPUs of multi-threading. The objective here is to return control to the user immediately while derivative data is being calculated in the background so the user can interact with the model before certain calculations complete. And this system is implemented as a framework currently used for color fills, but the plan is to use it for future asynchronous services. A progressive display framework similarly allows interaction with the model during the view update. Uh, this is similar to the Navisworks concept, updating geometry, allowing user interruption during the navigation. And the benefit is that we have fewer pauses during the model navigation. For handling graphics in large models, Navisworks is often used as a benchmark among the Autodesk products. So here is a video demonstrating user interaction with a large model in Revit and in Navisworks side by side. And as you can see, the performance is comparable. In some instances, Revit is faster. In some instances, Navisworks. But all in all, we can say that the two systems are definitely comparable. And that is a very good result that we are happy with. <coughs> The next area that we look at is collaboration. As said, we have growing projects with larger teams working with multiple disciplines in distributed locations and from different companies, all collaborating very closely together, for instance, through the A360 tool suite. Let's look at the history of collaboration from the Revit point of view. We initially saw projects being handled by teams in single locations, working behind a firewall and using file work sharing. As the projects grew, this expanded into entire enterprises with teams working in multiple locations, but initially still behind a firewall, making use of Revit server and Vault 
to handle the file sharing issues. Now we see the projects growing larger still, involving multiple companies in multiple locations and there is no longer a possibility to hide behind a firewall, so we make use of managed access to interact with the data and a suitable tool for that kind of collaboration are the web services provided by A360. We have also been running a beta program with a version of Revit called Skyscraper, which lives entirely in the cloud and uses A360 as the one and only storage media. So that provides built-in collaboration right from the onset and immediate communication and collaboration with all team members and access to the model data through these web services on the cloud. So what we're looking at is providing a sort of operating system collaboration experience within Revit for multi-firm collaboration, unifying the experience with the work sharing and Revit server, providing total access to all the associated model services completely integrated with A360. Currently, the Revit API does not provide any specific API access to this functionality. We can make use of the existing A360 uh, and rather BIM360 glue for collaboration and BIM360 field APIs for providing access to the BIM data on the construction site. The next area that we look at is modeling, providing more access to the Revit elements, their data, creation of elements and geometry API. The Direct Shape API was introduced in Revit 2015. One strong reason for introducing this was to enable better interaction with IFC files and provide the ability to define elements and geometry directly within the project file without having to create a dedicated family definition for each geometric instance. This Direct Shape functionality has been enhanced significantly in Revit 2016, providing support for referencing, room bounding and curves and points. So now the Direct Shape elements support element references, enabling us to align and dimension these objects, also enabling the Direct Shape elements to host face-based family instances. There's a new property, the Direct Shape Options Referencing option to control this behavior. Direct Shape elements can participate in room boundary calculations with another property controlling that. And finally, the original Direct Shapes supported faces and thus uh, two-dimensional and three-dimensional geometry. We can now also include one dimensional and zero dimensional curves and points into direct shapes using the new wireframe builder class. Other enhancements to the geometry API include creation of solids through the solid utils clone and create transform methods, creation of curve loops using transform and create via transform, new boolean operations on solids to cut with a half space, the possibility to control the graphics style of curve elements, and a new loft geometry creation method on the geometry creation utilities, which creates either a solid or open shell geometry lofting between curve loops. All of these enhancements in direct shapes and geometry directly affect and enhance the interaction with IFC files. So now we can use IFC models and linked IFC models as references for dimensions, alignment, snapping and hosting of face-based families. Let's look at a demonstration of this functionality directly in Revit 2016. So I'll switch to Windows.
and to a beta version of Revit 2016 running here. I'm in a project for building a loft element and I have a macro defined in this project called add road loft with sections. I'll run this macro and it 